Last week, we read the story of Jesus healing the official's son, and that was in John chapter 4. Today, we're going to just flip one page over to John chapter 5, and it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And I know we're only a few weeks into this, but let's kind of just briefly look at how we got here. Jesus has just come from Galilee, where the gospel writers tell us he was performing many signs and wonders, teaching the people. Yes, John has not recorded a lot of those miracles, but now Jesus has performed several by now. And we are near the end of Jesus' second year of ministry. He has reached the pinnacle of his popularity with the people, and as we saw last week, not necessarily for the right reasons. A lot of the people in the crowds were looky-loos who just wanted to see a magic trick or they wanted to see the drama that was brewing between him and the religious teachers. So Jesus of Nazareth is a household name by now. He is a topic of much discussion and speculation, a debate for the disciples and seekers and even his enemies. According to John, Jesus has traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem in order to celebrate a feast or a festival. We don't know for sure which one, but it may have been the Feast of Pentecost, a feast commemorating the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And so while he is here in Jerusalem, Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. Now, rumor has it that this pool is special. There is a legend that says that an angel at certain times would come down to the pool, disturb the face of the water, and whomever was the first person to enter the water, they were cured of any illness. Whether or not this actually happened, nobody knows, but that's what the people believe. Verse 2 says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So it's in this setting that we find Jesus going to this pool near the Sheep Gate, a pool that has five entryways. And he is surrounded by what the author defines as a multitude of those who are sick, blind, lame, withered. We don't know if Jesus performed other miracles while he's there at the pool, either before approaching this man or after, but for whatever reason, we highlight this particular interaction. Just as he has been highlighting, right? John's been highlighting all the others so far. Verse 5 says, One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, the passage tells us that he's been an invalid for 38 years. Notice it doesn't say that he's been at the pool for 38 years, but he's probably been there for a while, or at least his friends have been taking him there often. Verse 6 says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. So verse seven indicates that the man has tried in the past to get down to the water, but someone always gets there ahead of him. So with all that in mind, isn't it puzzling, or at least on the surface, that Jesus would approach him with this question, do you want to get well? I mean, isn't that why all these people are here? John has already told us that Jesus saw him lying there. Jesus already knows that this man has been there and had his condition for a long time. So on the, on the surface, the question seems silly. No sick person would choose to remain sick. On the other hand, the phrasing of Jesus' question reveals that he kind of already knows the answer. Because as God, Jesus knows the condition of this man's heart. And we get a glimpse of that in how he responds. He doesn't say, yes, of course, I want to get well. And he also doesn't say, well, duh. In fact, he doesn't even ask who Jesus is. He doesn't challenge 
He doesn't push back in any way. His answer is just this excuse, like from someone who's given up, right? It's almost like he's saying, hey, what do you want from me? I I can't even get to the water on my own. Nobody will help me. I try, but, you know, what can I do? Somebody always gets there first. This is my life. His answer isn't filled with hope. Instead, he's playing the victim. And then Jesus, what he does next is equally strange. In listening to the man's response, he doesn't say, well, hey, buddy, do you need help getting to the pool? And he also doesn't say, do you have faith that you can be healed? No. What does Jesus say? Look at the next verse. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. This man just gave Jesus an excuse. We don't even know if this man understands who is standing in front of him. But Jesus doesn't ask anything of him. He just says, get up, take your bed, and go. Did you ever notice that Jesus has no real pattern to how he heals? His miracles are all very different. The man who came down from the roof that was lowered by his friends, Jesus told him, your faith has healed you. When the blind men approach Jesus, he asks them a question. He says, do you believe I can do this? But Jesus doesn't ask the crippled man about his faith at all. In fact, only a few of the 30 plus miracles that Jesus does are consequences of faith. Verse 13 of our text declares that the lame man didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't even recognize Jesus. Therefore, there can be no question then that faith was not a condition of the healing. That means this time, Jesus heals someone who didn't ask to be healed. The guy doesn't even know who Jesus is. But Jesus does it anyway, solely because he wants to. And then, did we notice in verse 9? I mean, we're so familiar with these stories. I think we miss all the little details. You know, and, and if we really thought about them, it would make us pause. The guy just leaves. <laughs> he doesn't even say thank you. In other accounts of Jesus' miracles, we see people giving thanks to God. You, uh, remember the man born blind? He says, I was blind and now I see. We see people falling at Jesus' feet and declaring him both Lord and God. We even have the story of the leper who was so excited he came back and he searched for Jesus solely for the purpose of thanking him. Not this man. He picks up his bed and walks away. Apparently without saying anything. It says, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man that said to me, take up your bed and walk. So the next key players in this story are the religious leaders. They come up to the man and they say, hey, it, it, it's a day of rest. It's a day of rest. You're, you're not allowed to carry an object on a holy day. And what does the man do? He offers an excuse, right? Hey, it wasn't my idea. That guy that healed me, he told me to do this. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. So yeah, there's our confirmation, right? This man didn't even know that it was Jesus. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see you are well, sin no more, and nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 14 says that Jesus found this man. He found him later on at the temple. And then we're given a little more insight into the situation by what Jesus says to him. He says, see you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. What does Jesus seem to be implying here? Well, that perhaps this man has not led a good life. He may have been crippled, 
But that didn't seem to stop him from getting into trouble, nor did being crippled drive him any closer to God or hope. Instead, he was seeking answers at some mythical magic pool. It almost sounds like a warning, doesn't it? Jesus sees him at the temple and says, hey there, you look, you look good, all right, great. Hey, stay out of trouble from now on, okay? And the Bible still doesn't record this man thanking Jesus. 38 years as a cripple, healed in minutes, doesn't thank Jesus. Instead, he goes back to the religious leaders and turns Jesus in. Hey, who was that guy? The guy that told me to carry my bed on the Sabbath? Hey, psst, hey, come here. You want to know who that guy was? Yeah, the guy you're looking for? It's Jesus. Now, as I mentioned from the beginning, Jesus and the signs he's doing, they have become a household topic by now. And it's very safe to assume, since the religious leaders were constantly confronting him in public, the crowds were also aware that there's this friction between Jesus and the religious leaders. Verse 16 says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Now in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this day and I too am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So the last verse of this story is another clue as to why John includes this miracle as opposed to any others. Because it ends with an ungrateful man running to the enemies of Jesus, the very one who gave him back his legs, cured him of 38 years of being an invalid, and then ratting him out. Again, like the miracles we've looked at already, on the surface, it's an immediate healing of a lame man. Jesus' healing is instantaneous. Jesus' healing is complete. The guy gets up and walks, even though he hasn't walked in 38 years. And the miracle is undeniable. But John also adds another dimension to the miracle. When he relates that this took place on a Sabbath. In, in verse 9, we were told the day was a Sabbath, and it, it, that's the day the miracles performed. The Gospels record uh, seven other Sabbath healings. Jesus heals the demoniac in the synagogue at Capernaum on the Sabbath. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus heals the cripple at Bethesda. Jesus heals the man with the withered hand. Jesus heals the man born blind. Jesus heals the woman bound by Satan. Jesus heals the man with dropsy. Why do so many miracles take place on the Sabbath? Why is Jesus working on a day when he is supposed to be resting? He certainly does not seem to care about Sabbath rules. In fact, knowing full well that, is, that it is the Sabbath, he gives the man very specific instructions. Carry your bed. Why? Well, I believe that Jesus worked this miracle on the Sabbath on purpose. Of course it was on purpose. But why? To focus the attention of the religious leaders on the fact that they are missing the point of the Sabbath and that he is, in fact, Lord of the Sabbath. The day on which this place took place was a Sabbath, and the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. The man is intercepted by the religious leaders, who informed him, hey, you're breaking the law by carrying your bed on the Sabbath. They're not concerned about this man. They don't even know that he has been healed. Their only concern is the man is breaking the rules. Their rules. Remember, the rule was no work on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, was, the Sabbath is established by God when he finished creating. When he finished working on the seventh day, God rests. 
He stopped creating. He stopped working. He was done. Not necessarily tired, he was done. He completed the task. He declared it a special day, and he set it aside as a day of rest from work. He told us that we can work for the first six days of the week, but on the seventh, not to work. It's set aside as a special day to appreciate God's creation and God's power. Now, legalists in Christ's time, the scribes and the Pharisees and the others, they get this idea that the more rules, the more laws, the better. So they went into all the intricate minutia of each and every possible aspect of what work means and what rest means to the point where now people are afraid to even move. But that was not the point of the commandment. Jesus didn't do what he did because he was against the Sabbath. He was against the legalistic approach to obedience. So Jesus nor this man are really breaking any biblical law. The commandment is clear. Work six days, don't work on the seventh. So they set aside a day to relax and enjoy God. We do this by praying, studying spiritual things, discussing spiritual things, going to church, worship, what have you. You can do any other thing you want on the other six days, but rest from work is exclusive for the Sabbath. It is a day of renewal. It is a day of restoration. So verse 18 says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And this may be another reason why John includes this particular story. Because we often remember very clearly that Judas betrays Jesus. But this crippled man clearly betrays Jesus first. Jesus kind of even hints at maybe this man hasn't exactly lived the best life. Straighten up and fly right, Jesus tells him. And instead, the guy runs off to the authorities. And then John tells us the religious leaders began to persecute Jesus. This is an important feature of this miracle. This began an open conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders that would one day culminate in his ultimate betrayal and the cross. Because this miracle was done on a Sabbath day, it gave rise to the first demonstration of him being rejected by the religious leaders. But it's more than that. It's the reason Jesus gives for breaking their rule. Jesus says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Jesus defends his actions by pointing out that he is merely imitating his father in heaven. If anyone is allowed to work on a Sabbath, it's God. If anyone is allowed to break the rules, surely it's the one who makes the rules. Jesus says, my father is working and I am working too. And the religious leaders have no trouble understanding what he is saying because of the next verse. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he even called God his own father, making himself equal with God. You see, down the road, they're going to bring Jesus to Pilate. And they're going to claim that Jesus is an insurrectionist and that he's trying to lead a rebellion against Rome. But that is not the reason that they want him dead. They want him dead because Jesus claimed to be God. Listen, don't let anyone try to tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God or that he was a lesser being or that he was a great teacher or that even Jesus was confused about who he was. Read the story again. Jesus knows who he is. 
He says it boldly. And it's for that reason. That reason. Not because he healed on the Sabbath. The lame man told the religious leaders Jesus had the power to heal. They could have cared less. And rather than give glory to God for the miracle that takes place, they demanded to know, who has the audacity to do this? They find out it's Jesus, confront him, and Jesus says, yeah, I did it, and I alone have the authority to do it. So there's that, the factual side of the story. But there's also a possible deeper side just beneath the surface. Could this unnamed, ungrateful man be a symbol of the nation of Israel? Deuteronomy 2.14 says the nation of Israel wandered in the desert for 38 years. They were lost, rebellious, for 38 years until they finally reached salvation in the promised land. The story also tells us that there's five doorways to the pool where the sick and the lame would hang out and wait. Could this be a symbol of the five books of the law? The law could tell this lame man what was wrong in his life. It could show him where it fell short, but it couldn't fix him. Only Jesus has the power to fix him. And when the religious leaders stop and ask him why he does what he does, Jesus' answer seems to reflect, I do what I see God do. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, what should I do? When something happens in life and you don't see an obvious answer or an obvious direction, you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Here in the story, we see two very clear things in Jesus. You see an example of purpose. This man at the pool of Bethesda was seemingly indifferent to the fact that he is now able to pick up his bed and walk for the first time in 38 years. His life is forever different now, but he doesn't seem to care. Maybe that's why Jesus asked him, do you really want to be healed? But Jesus obviously had a reason for singling this man out. Yes, Jesus had compassion. But, and I'm sure compassion was the primary motivator in his seeking this man out and doing what he did. But if you look carefully at the whole story, you get a picture of Jesus coming into the city, going into the pool, walking up to this man, asking him a question, then as, no, that, as though no matter what the man would have said, it doesn't change Jesus' mind. And Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. And then Jesus disappears into the crowd. Now, we can speculate somewhat as to what Jesus' specific purpose was in this act, but the one thing that you can say for certain was he does it because it's what God does. He says, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Jesus tells us that his purpose is to do what he sees God doing. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus reads his mission statement. When he reads the scroll of Isaiah, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This unnamed man, he is a captive, isn't he? To his illness to sin, and Jesus sets him free. Jesus sees the Father having compassion for the hopeless. Apparently, he sees the Father taking whatever steps called for to complete his eternal plan, to bring to pass all that was declared must come to pass before the great consummation of all things. He saw that. And his purpose was to do the work given to him to do. Whether it's talking to the despised Samaritan woman by Jacob's well, or laying bare hands on a leprous head, or speaking healing to an ingrate hanging out by a magic swimming pool. 
Jesus is our greatest example of purpose. And he's our greatest example of obedience. It's no accident that the story goes the way it does. Jesus didn't heal the wrong guy. I believe Jesus was always in complete control, not only on the day of his arrest and his trial, but all throughout his crucifixion. But even now, in his ministry, I believe he is in control of all circumstances. Furthermore, I believe that his greatest tool, his greatest source of power is to control these circumstances. And he is unfaltering and unwavering in his obedience to the Father. There's no surprises. He knew what was ahead. He knew every step. And it was an act of obedience, a step toward his ultimate reason for being, to save us all. And in our text today, we see him deliberately finding a man in the temple, seeking him out, and revealing who he is. Did he know this man was going to run and tell his enemies? You bet he did. Just as surely as he knew the man would never thank him. How is that an example for us? Our tendency is to go through life seeking our own good and our own comfort. If something requires courage or it requires strength or it requires standing out in the crowd, we kind of tend to avoid those things. The word obedience is scary to us because we know that to obey God comes with consequences. Jesus knew the price he had to pay, what it would do, who it would tip off, and his excuse was right there. This guy won't even appreciate it. In fact, if Jesus shows him compassion, he's going to show Jesus none. Right? He's going to betray Jesus. Does that stop Jesus from exercising his healing power? Does that stop Jesus from extending mercy? Does that stop Jesus from showing compassion to this ingrate by the pool? Nope. Philippians 2.8 says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. No matter what, Circumstances lay ahead, Jesus obeyed. Joanna and I watch um, game shows, reality game shows frequently, and a word pops up a lot in that world, and it's the word deserve. People say, they don't deserve to win, or they don't deserve to get the money, or they don't deserve to be here. Do I think this crippled man deserved Jesus' compassion? Probably not. He didn't ask to be saved. Doesn't even thank Jesus. Ultimately betrays him. But Jesus didn't make a mistake. Jesus' charity is not misplaced. Jesus is our greatest example of compassion toward all whether deserving or not. Our purpose should be the same as Christ, to do the work that the Father has given us to do. Our God is, our God is loving, and so followers of Jesus are loving. Our God shows grace and forgiveness, and so as Jesus followers, we do too. Jesus followed the example of his heavenly Father, he showed compassion for someone, even though it didn't benefit him. Ultimately, even got him further in trouble. Hebrews 5 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That verse, 
says that even though he was closer than anyone to God, he still practiced obedience. And if we practice obedience, we can be an example just like him. Wouldn't it be great to know that in the end, that by following his example, we became, for those around us, a sign that points the way to salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we know that your son is still a healer by nature. He spent his ministry healing. And even now, all across the world, more voices are asking to be healed, waiting for compassion. Lord, in your great mercy and in your will, you listen to those prayers. Lord, we just ask that you would lay healing hands on those who are sick and who need your touch. Those who are walking with the greatest of illnesses and even those with just scrapes and bruises. We know that you have the power to heal all, to comfort sorrow. Lord, you have the power to raise the dead. And as such, you have the power to change lives. Give each one here the courage to follow your purpose in seeking to do the will of the Father every single day with bravery, knowing that even if it doesn't benefit us, it is still a benefit to the kingdom. That even though it doesn't benefit us, it perhaps benefits those who watch us. May we seek to be a better example of you and your kingdom each and every day. We thank you for stories like this, stories that remind us and stories that stretch us to become more like your son each and every day. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. Of course, I want to remind you that we have a church here in the Walden community. We're in uh, Montgomery, and so our church is uh, over on Walden Road. You can find us at waldenchurch.com. We have two services every Sunday. The first is at 9.30. We have a choir. We're going to sing a songs out of the hymnal. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. At 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come casual. Come however you feel the most comfortable. Bring your kids. We have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.